I'm grateful to be with you. My one son attended here at Gordon as a consortium student from Wheaton College, had a brilliant experience here. Loved it deeply. I've enjoyed every time I've been on this campus. And I do love Jesus. When I go to bed each night and pillow talk with my wife is over, I lay in bed and I just thank him for loving me. And I tell him each night, God, I love you so deeply. I love you. The scriptures say in Philemon 6, I pray that you will be active in sharing your faith so that you'll have a full understanding of every good thing you have in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, this is one morning and a lifetime of mornings. Quickly upon us, quickly it will pass. I pray that your Holy Spirit would take this morning, however, and plant deep in the heart of each person here something that will remain and reverberate throughout the rest of their days, even long after they've forgotten where they heard it. And I ask this in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. That verse I just recited has a word in it that talks about the most intimate level of knowledge. And if you want the most intimate level of knowledge with God, it says it's somehow connected with sharing your faith in Christ. I want to talk about that, and I want to, at the end, give a few practical ways we might do this. But I want to talk about five ways we'll grow. If there's five, there could be 505. But let's just look at five quickly where we'll grow. I grew up, number one, discovering that people ask questions when you share your faith, and it'll help you grow. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles, um, and I didn't hear the gospel there. I went to a church, but I never heard the gospel at the church. I was told if Jesus came back while I was in a movie theater, I would go to hell forever, and I would not go to heaven because I went to a movie. I wanted to see Walt Disney's The Shaggy Dog, but didn't know if it was worth risking my eternal destiny to go see. <laughs> the neighbor lady, Mrs. Greenlee, asked my mom if my brothers and I could go see this movie. And I looked at my mom with ambivalence, wanting to go on one hand, not wanting to go on the other. And when my mom said, yeah, we could go, I began to wonder if she really loved me, that she'd put my life in such eternal peril. I deduced as a child from things I had heard at my church that if I could lose any relationship I had with God based on what I did, that I had to gain it based on what I did, and I was always in trouble. And I came to the conclusion I was not going to be going to heaven. And so I said, what difference does it make? And I had this little window of opportunity, and I thought I would just at least have fun while I could. And what I discovered in that process is that... Um, I just hurt myself and I hurt the people that I cared for. And I came to the end of my high school days in existential despair and went to college with great angst. And it was in college that I heard for the first time that God loved me and he forgave me. I had no clue that that was part of Christianity. I was so moved by it that I thought anybody who had lived a moment of honest life would know they're messed up and would want to know they were forgiven, and anybody who lived a moment of honest life would want to know that they were loved unconditionally, with a love that's ontological. God is love. His love is not improved by our well-doing, nor is it diminished by our poor doing. So I started sharing Christ with my friends. And they started asking me questions, questions I had never thought of before. If God's good and all-powerful, why is there evil in the universe? That question had never crossed my mind until I started sharing the gospel. How do we know the Bible is really God's word? How come Jesus says he's the only way? Isn't that narrow? How come Christians are so obnoxious with such narrowness? What about other religions and so on? And I just thought to myself, those are great questions. I don't know the answers. And so I started digging. And I would come back and I would share the answers that I had found with my friends. And some of my friends came to faith. Some of them just asked more questions. But I learned also not to be afraid of questions. If you have no questions about your faith, you're delusional. You think you've achieved omniscience or something. No, you should have questions. And the questions should be fully compatible with the life of love of God. I had a man, one of my uh, students' father came to me one time. He said, Jerry, how's your, how's your soul? I like the question. I tried to give him a quick answer. I, I, I think that... Uh, my soul's good. I've, I've never had more questions about my faith than I have right now. And he looked at me with this look of great consternation. 
He thought there was incongruity in these things, and I saw the consternation on his face. It seemed to suggest, I hope my son gets in no more of your classes at Wheaton College. But I felt the burden of clarifying, and so I said to him, listen, I've never felt more in love with God than I feel right now, and I've never felt more loved by him than I feel right now. I feel like a child who's in a perfectly safe love relationship, who can ask all the questions he wants and knows he won't be trashed for asking the questions, and knows the answers are forthcoming, and knows that if the answers aren't forthcoming, he trusts the one with the answers until they come. What has happened to our subculture that to have questions and to feel loved by God have become incompatibles when they should be as natural as my little five-year-old grandkids saying to me, Papa, what about this? Why? Why? It should be so natural. People will ask you questions, and you will grow. And if you're not sharing your faith, you won't be challenged by the questions that are affecting our secular society. Second, people will scrutinize your life. I knew a man once who said, I'd never put a Christian bumper sticker on my car. If I did, I'd have to drive better. <laughs> if you start sharing your faith, people are going to want to know, does your life match your words? When I came to faith, my life was all messed up. I still struggle with hosts of things now. But you know, one of the things that helps me in that process of working through and taking my faith seriously is when I hear the world question, not only me, but the church in general. I remember when I was a sophomore in college, I prayed, Lord, discipline me. And the next three months that follow were three of the worst months of my life up to that time. I never pray that anymore. <laughs> I always have prayed, Lord, keep me from a stiff neck, give me a soft heart, and teach me vicariously through the mistakes of others so I won't have to go through them. But if you share your faith, people will start to point things out. And if they don't point them out to you specifically, because they don't know you very well, they'll say all kinds of horrible things about the church and church history and so on. And that gives you an opportunity, and the humility of your heart before God, because you know what a screw-up you are and you know how deep the love of God reaches to you. Maybe you could represent that love to that person. And you can say, well, let me stand as a surrogate in the place of anybody who's ever hurt you in the name of Christ and say to you, that was wrong. And I am so sorry that happened. Will you forgive us? Because I wouldn't want anything to stand between you and knowing how much you are deeply loved by God. No. You share your faith, people ask you questions. You share your faith, people will scrutinize your life. You share your faith, and you'll be given an opportunity to diagnose how your own love for God is going. We had a group of our women's softball team that were going to Latin America, and they were uh, going to do uh, sports ministry, and they wanted to have a training time on how to share your faith. And I went and met with them, and I, I said, all the statistics in America show the church just isn't doing it. And I'm, trying, I'm scratching my head. I'm trying to figure out why. This one young woman on the softball team said, I think it's because we're afraid of what people will think about us. And the light went on. Wow then we've become idolaters. Because we're more concerned about what that person will think about us than what Jesus will think about us, who loves us deeply. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned about what people think about us, because we can sometimes be obnoxious. And we don't want to be obnoxious. But ultimately, our identity should rest in who we are in Christ. And if our identity rests in Christ, then that gives us an opportunity to speak about the one that we love so much. But if we're afraid because we're more afraid of what that person thinks about us than what Jesus thinks about us, that's a good thing for us then to learn that it's time to lather up more in the love of Christ. And in coming to know his love for us so much more, it will just spill out of us naturally. We talk about the things we love, and we do it naturally and winsomely and easily. It's not coerced and so on. Next, we'll grow in our sense of justice, I believe, as we share our faith. The ancients understood that justice was that feature of virtue that realizes growth in character is at some level linked to our responsibility to others. Some people divide in our day and in our Christian circles, something that Jesus always held together. Is it an act of social justice, confronting the systemic evil, or is it proclamation of the gospel? The bifurcation is not a natural one. It's like asking which wing of an airplane is more important, the right one or the left one. 
Seems to me it needs both to fly. Confronting systemic evil is important for us. It's very important. But true change also begins with the transformation of the heart. And we don't want to leave the gospel out of that. We'll also grow because we'll keep seeing Jesus show up in our life. We don't have to take him anywhere. We don't take Jesus to anybody. He's already there. He's more intimately concerned about that person's welfare than you and I will ever be. We get to go and make explicit what he might be doing implicitly. We ask questions of the person, public questions, not intrusive ones. We listen for the answer. Whatever answer is given is often given with permission to ask more about the information that's been given. And we can go deeper and deeper, and it's not very long before we can get pretty deep with a person. I remember this Uber driver a couple weeks ago in New York City, I started talking to him. Wasn't but a few minutes before I found out he had been in prison and he was trying to figure out how to forgive people that he was angry with and so on. And boom, we were there, we started talking about the gospel. He was so interested, he got lost in New York City. I thought he was supposed to get found when I shared the gospel and we both got lost. You'll keep seeing Jesus show up because you'll see people, when you ask them questions and concern about them, you'll see their hearts begin to open up. You can know him for years at church. You'll never get to really know him until you get to know him in his workplace, the world where he's deeply concerned. Let your heart break for the people that his life was sacrificed for. Okay, so those are some ways we'll grow. Now let's look at a few practical things. I remember when I was a brand new Christian, the church I went to, the senior pastor at that church pulled me aside and he said, Jerry, if God answered every prayer you prayed this last week, would there be anybody new in the kingdom? That was interesting. I thought, well, I could start praying for people. So I did. I started praying for people and and then I would encourage those people by every once in a while letting them know I was praying for them. That same pastor said, people who pray see lots of coincidences. I think that's true. So let's give you an example of just prayer. All of us can do that. We, you had a day of prayer here yesterday. How you can use your prayer to open up doors for the gospel. Find 10 people in your world who don't know Christ. I heard 60% of you drive cars here. If you're driving cars, you've got to get gas. You want to do Muslim evangelism? Sometimes there may be a Pakistani guy working in the, in the gas station. Get to know him and love him. You want to do cross-cultural evangelism? There's opportunities. Don't pay at the pump. Go in. Get to know the person's name. Begin praying for them. Pray for them regularly. And then you can um, let them know that you pray for them. So here's an example. Um, There was a restaurant in this town where I lived, and the guy who owned the restaurant was a guy named Brad. It was a sports bar and grill, and he was a former NFL player, and I got to know him a little bit. So I started praying for him every day, and I would go in there four days a week for working lunches. And every day I would have small talk with him. How's how's business, Brad? Hey, I like the mahi-mahi sandwich. I hope you keep it on the menu. After three weeks of small talk with him, praying for him every day, I said to him, Brad, I pray for you every day. That's as aggressive as I got. I've never had a person say back to me, well, would you stop it? (laughs) Most people are moved. Somebody's praying for them. Three weeks that followed, small talk. And then after three weeks, I said it again, Brad, I pray for you every day. He said, you know, you said that a few weeks back. I didn't believe you. But if you're saying it again, you must really be praying for me. I said, I never miss, Brad. He said to me, Jerry, would you pray for my boys too? I wrote down the names of his boys. I came home to uh, dinner that night, and around the table I said, hey, Brad asked me to pray for his boys, and my daughter Alicia, whom Lisa used to mentor, my daughter Alicia said, Dad, I know his one son. He goes to my school. I wish it could have been there five months later when Alicia came running home from youth group and saying, Dad, one of the guys brought Brad's son to youth group tonight, And he gave his heart to Jesus. She believes God answers those prayers. Well, that's the way it went for months. Every three weeks, I'd just tell him I was praying for him. But he had a lot of small talk in between. About, I don't know, nine months into it, he came up to me while I was eating with some businessmen. And and he said to me, Jerry, I need to talk to you after lunch. So I cleared my schedule for that afternoon. We went down to a coffee shop. And for three hours, he poured out his heart to me, weeping as he talked. Why? Why? The deepest we had ever gotten was, I pray for you every day, and I think he had something heavy on his heart, and he needed to unpackage it with somebody he felt cared for him, and because I had prayed for him faithfully, that was the depth of the relationship. Three hours, weeping, and finally at the end of his sharing, I said, you know what, Brad, I think you need Jesus in your life. 
I shared the gospel in a few minutes, and he looked at me, and he said, you know what, Jerry? I think I need Jesus, too, but I don't want to give him my life like it is right now. I want to fix it first, then I'll give it to him. I said, Brad, you can try it like that. It doesn't usually work that way, but you try it, and if it doesn't work, you let me know. So we went back to, again, seeing him several times a, a week and then telling him every third week I was praying for him. About five months later, I get a call from Brad. Jerry, my way's not working. Can I come to your office? And he came to my office, and I never in my life saw anybody use more Kleenex to come to Jesus than that former NFL football player. And uh, there's no place in here that says you have to use Kleenex. We started follow-up with Brad. And eventually I moved away and he moved away. And it wasn't long after that he died. Just dropped dead of a heart attack. And one day I will introduce you to him. Because the gospel matters. It matters. Uh, one day I was sitting at home. I had Fridays off in those days. And I said, Lord, there's somebody in my world that I'm not seeing. They're on your radar screen. They're not on mine. Give me a heart that matches your heart for the world opened my eyes, and just then the garbage guy pulled up. I go, wow, I don't even have to look for that guy. He comes into my world once a week on Fridays at 10 o'clock. So the next week, I was ready for him. It was a hot time of the year. I had a glass of iced tea already. I heard the truck pull up. It was one of those trucks where they had to walk around the basket in the back and throw the trash in. So I, had, I was out there before he walked around the back, and I've got the iced tea in my hand. He comes around, and he's kind of surprised to see me. I said, you look like you could use a break. Here's some iced tea. I'll throw the trash. And I see this guy. He's looking at the tea, and he's looking at me, and he's wondering, is it safe? Takes a little sip, you know. I said, what's your name? He said, Mike. Oh, people, I had written down garbage guy the week before. I erased garbage guy, and I put down Mike. He has a name. He has a world he's living in. He has concerns and things heavy on his heart and joys that he could experience. And I can speak the gospel and the word can, can become flesh into his world once again. Every week I had something cold for him to drink in the hot part of the year, warm for him to drink in the cold part of the year. And one day he came by at noon. This had been going on for months. He came by at noon one day. I said, Mike, you're late on your route. What happened? I had some trouble on my route. Well, I said, well, it's about noon. Did you eat lunch yet? He said, no. I haven't. I said, well, you want to come in and I'll make you a sandwich. He says, okay. I didn't know those guys could do that. He came into my house. I made him a sandwich. <laughs> you know what else was interesting? He changed his whole route and he came by at noon every week after that. <laughs> and it wasn't long where over lunch I was able to share the gospel with Mike. You know what his story was? There was a woman in his neighborhood when he was little who had a heart for the kids in that neighborhood. She was growing close to Jesus and loved Jesus. How could she not then love the things that Jesus loved? And she had a backyard Bible club. And he said, I remember trusting Christ in a backyard Bible club. And my parents moved away and nothing's ever come of it. And so we started doing discipleship right there every week. I got him a Bible and we'd have Bible study every week over lunch. Isn't that cool? It wasn't long after that, he got traded off the route, and I got a new, new guy, Mick. Wow. <laughs> and I was able to share Jesus with Mick, too. And then there was, there was uh, Kevin, the bank teller. And then there was Steve. Steve was my mailman. He came every day to my house. <laughs> there are people in your world who want to hear about Jesus. They're in your world. You don't have to go looking for them. And I remember sharing with Steve, and he came to faith. I said, Steve, why don't you come to church with us one Sunday? He said, well, I'm divorced and I have my kids on the weekend. I said, our church has great stuff for kids. They'll love it. Come over for dinner afterwards. And so Steve brought his kids to church, came over for dinner. Claudia made a nice dinner. And afterwards, I got on my knees next to those boys and I shared the gospel with those boys. And Steve's boys came to Jesus too. There are people in your world who want to hear. It doesn't always go well. If you're afraid of striking out, don't play baseball. But if you don't play baseball, you'll never know the joy of hitting a home run. This text that we looked at said you'll grow more intimate towards Christ if you share your faith. I believe that's true. We looked at five ways that that might be so. People will ask questions. People will scrutinize your life. People will give you <clears throat> an opportunity to see if your love for God is drifting towards idolatry because you're more afraid of people than you are of understanding how much God loves you. You'll grow in your sense of justice because the gospel will never fall out of your deep concern to address systemic evil. 
and you'll keep seeing Jesus show up in your life. It's not too hard. You can start with prayer. Be concerned. Develop relationships with those around you. Dawson Trotman, who founded the Navigators, in a sermon he preached called Born to Reproduce, said a person is physiologically mature when we could reproduce physiologically, and a person is spiritually mature when we could reproduce spiritually. Lead a person to Christ, nurture that person so that we could then deploy that person to lead a person to Christ and mentor them. We had Martin Marty, the great church historian, come to our campus at Wheaton not long ago to talk about evangelism. So let's look seriously at this. Where has the church done it poorly? And it has. And where has the church done it well? And it has. We often want to take the poor example and hold that up and then define ourselves by that. Thomas Aquinas said in the Summa Theologica, an abuse doesn't nullify a proper use. If we judge any segment of society by its worst examples, nobody could ever stand. No, where did we do it poorly? What can we learn? Where did we do it well? What can we learn? And we had uh, Martin Marty, the great church historian, sharing these things with us, and it was fabulous. At dinner, before he shared, one of the faculty members said, um, Dr. Marty, what's the biggest challenge to evangelism in the next 20 years in America? And Marty just shot back indifference. Indifference. In an email I had with him shortly after, he wrote me and said, Jerry, let's keep pushing back the tides of indifference. And brothers and sisters, I pray that you will engage in that. And if you do, as Paul wrote to Philemon, you will grow more intimate towards Jesus. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of being here. And I thank you for the privilege of being able to address this topic before this group of people. Because I know that if those take this seriously, they will not only grow in their faith, but there will be people who will come to Christ. And that this moment, this morning, will matter forever. And I worship you for that, for Christ's sake. Amen. You're dismissed.